mentioned this idea that the Solomon Islands could switch diplomatic recognition back from the PRC to Taiwan. Um, over the last few decades, we've had a lot of countries switching from Taiwan to China. Now that I think there's only about a dozen or so left that still recognize Taiwan. But I don't think any country has ever switched back. When a country switches diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to the PRC, Taiwan does not punish them, right? Or they don't like send troops or do anything like that. But like, what would happen if a country, especially a small country like the Solomon Islands is like, goes back on that, um, th that would seem to be a very brave move and potentially risky. It is. There are few countries in the Pacific who have done. I mean, it was it was a while ago, but uh, Kiribati uh, recognized China. China set up a tracking station that was monitoring U.S. activity. They switched to Taiwan, shut it and, and shut it down. The difference between Taiwan and China also is that when China gets shut down, um, they tend to leave their people in the country to try to continue to exert influence and uh, figure out where the leverage points are and then find opposition parties that they can back to bring down the government. They don't, it doesn't stop. It's an ongoing political warfare thing. Um, whereas Taiwan tends to kind of pack its bags and go home with its tail between its legs. I think it's a mistake um, for many reasons. But there, there are examples that it was Kira's Naru also flipped back and forth a few times. It, 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 it ha this is a while ago, but it has happened. Uh, and in, in fact, the Pacific Islands, because they're, some of them are quite small and their economies are relatively small, they don't necessarily get so indebted to or economically uh, engaged with um, China in a way that some larger countries do. So de-parasiting the uh, Chinese economic uh, engagement in those countries is actually easier to do in many cases. And again, it goes back to this, this kind of core identity thing. People don't switch to Taiwan. Sudani doesn't switch to Taiwan because it's the opposite of China. He, his identity comes from being somebody who who's a person of you know, faith, freedom, family, all those things that we've talked about before. And if you're somebody like that, then you want closer engagement with countries that are like that, including the U.S. And Taiwan is one of the countries that is like that. So just sort of saying this is just a, a, a Taiwan-China thing or a, a U.S.-China thing really undervalues the importance of these core uh, identity and cultural issues to the people of the region who are making these decisions. It's about themselves and how they see them themselves fitting into their community and what they want for their community. Um, so I, I, I think it can happen, but as mentioned, I think it, it needs to be, they will, like you said, Matt, they'll, they'll get hit bad. Uh, and especially because this is so high profile, uh, but if, if they're protected, uh, it won't actually take much to protect them from it, again, because they're small. But if we don't do it, this is, th this is the front line. If China goes, what are you going to do about it? And the people of the Solomons aren't allowed to fight back in a way that gives them independence from the CCP, then it, you know, it, what are we going to do about it? Nothing. And then what happens? Next one, next one, next one. So what do you think will happen if if China does get the Solomon Islands? So I'm very concerned about this uh, disintegration into violence, and uh, which allows for the opening of increased authoritarianism, which pulls them out of the orbit uh, and is, is horrific for the people of the Solomons who've already gone through a civil war. And then you start to see all the things you would normally see when China comes in. People get kicked off their land. There's uh, a rapacious uh, approach to extracting resources. Um, families get ripped apart. Communities get ripped apart. Uh, there's increasing poverty and marginalization, which feeds into the violence cycle, which feeds into the authoritarianism cycle, which justifies the emplacement of more troops. 
uh, which then creates a cover for buildup off the coast of Australia and New Zealand to, to interdict the supply chains. So in that context, you can see how the creation of violence within the Solomons actually, in multiple ways, benefits China strategically. Uh, and then from there, they've got a jumping off point even more into PNG and into Vanuatu and maybe even into New Caledonia, which is you know, where the French have the independence issue. And the one that really isn't getting enough attention is Bougainville, uh, which is a, an area of PNG that is voted for independence at like 98 um, percent. And it has a timeline for independence, but it's not being handled properly or at all by the PNG government. And so that's another area where you could create a schism. And they have a huge copper mine, which I'm sure the Chinese would love to get their hands on. So it, this this kind of uh, knotted ball of uh, violence, resource extraction, authoritarianism, and uh, blocking out of the ability to support strategically or kinetically um, it, it has the potential to be expanding quite rapidly if the people of the region aren't given the tools they need to fight it off. Well, I think a lot of people might hear like, it's like China makes a military base in the Solomon Islands. So what? The U.S. has military bases all over the world. Is It's not like China is going to immediately launch an invasion of Australia or New Zealand. What's the big deal? Yeah. And, and I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you framed it like that because you get a lot of that. And, you, and this is, in, this is also, uh, this equip, this equivalency of, oh, you know, the U S and China, and there, there is at a societal level, there, there is no equivalency. And, and not to say again, colonial period is really bad. The Australians and New Zealanders did, uh, did really messed up things. Um, the uh, the Americans have done really messed up things. You can ask the Marshall Islands about sixty seven nuclear tests in and around their their country. You know, there's that's, but they were that that was wrong. That was wrong to do. So do we enable an even bigger wrong to happen now because uh, other countries did a wrong thing then? And the big the bigger wrong component of it is the way that uh, China engages has so many more depths of penetration into a society. So you look at a, at a classic uh, Pacific Island country, there are multiple different sorts of, kind of Chinese, ethnic Chinese. You'll have the old communities that have been there for very long, generations that are not part of this discussion. Uh, then you'll have the, the business elites who who are the elite capture front force. They're the guys that people who will go out and figure out who the key entry points are, political and economic, and buy them up and co-opt them. Then you'll have the, the local shopkeepers who are often in the country for maybe five to 10 years. And their goal is to extract as much money out of the economy as possible. And, they're, and they tend to not be liked. Uh, so in the case of Tonga, for example, when you had the explosion, the volcanic eruption and the tsunami, uh, it knocked out power, which meant the ATMs went dead. So people didn't have cash. And uh, I know of a case where somebody went to the, the local Chinese shop and they're all they're called Chinese shops. They're all 80 percent or 90 percent of the sector. And I needed some baby formula for their kid. And because they didn't have cash, uh, they were declined credit. And this is a shop that in their tiny little village, which they go to on a daily basis. And um, they'll never forget that. That family will never forget that th that shop in their village, where the people are only going to be there for five to seven years, wouldn't help them during a tsunami, wouldn't help them at a time of crisis. So there's that. That never happened with the uh, Western colonial, colonial engagements. And then there's the those um, laborers that move through the area, some of whom seem to be prisoners who are paying off their prison time. And they bring in uh, drugs, prostitution, gambling, facilitated in many cases by the retail shops and covered over politically in terms of prosecution by the elite, by the, that economic elite. 
So you were talking about a corruption, a societal corruption at a very deep level, levels of drug abuse and gambling, and which is already feeding into a society that's losing a lot of jobs because the Chinese are coming in with their own infrastructure projects and hiring their own people and, and taking over key pieces of property and kicking people off their land. So it's a, it's, it's a very um, integrated into the society method of breaking down uh, what are very normally very tight social units. So this is something completely different. You know, the, the military base is kind of the visual or the big tip of the spear of, or top of the pyramid of that very wide engagement into these societies, which is disruptive on a scale that we haven't seen, uh, with the exception of maybe missionaries, uh, at a at a very uh, disruptive level, and the and the which is why people like Daniel Sudani and many others are very concerned about this engagement. It's not about the base for them, although the base is a real problem. It's about what it's doing to their communities and their societies. 